Okay, so let's start. Um, we have uh, Ronnie uh, as our first case. And Ronnie is an 11 year old male neuter Springer Spaniel. And he's been in the owner's possession since um, very young age and he's always been healthy. Um, he's up to date with his vaccine, vaccines, but when you question the owner regarding the worming and flea treatment, he's not straightforward saying that he's been uh, keeping up with it. He has no known travel history and he presents himself today because he is collapsed. Now, when you click, when you question the owner, he says, actually, there's been a progressive exercise in tolerance for approximately two weeks, but now this is really marked and he, you know, doesn't get out of the house, doesn't want to, to walk. Um, and he's also mentions that there's been an increased respiratory rate for the past three to five days. Um, again, uh, there's been no other changes, no vomit, no diarrhea, no cough that the owner can um, remember or uh, sneezing. Uh, so his main problem is progressive exercise intolerance and that he's now he's collapsed and tachypneic. So on physical exam, um, Ronnie was quiet but responsive, so you could still alert him. He was fairly obese with a body condition score of eight out of nine. Um, you could appreciate that his mucous membranes were markedly pale, and he was tachycardic at 160 beats per minute with hyperdynamic pulses that were synchronous with the heartbeat. Uh, he was also tachypneic, as we mentioned before, and he was normothermic and had a very heavy flea burden. And this is Ronnie actually after being brushed and all of the dirt, all of the black dots that you can appreciate in this sheet, all of that is actually the fleas and uh, flea dirt. So a really, really marked flea burden. burden. So um, we did uh, hematology in-house, and this is uh, uh, values from the pro site which you can see here. And uh, the values that we got was that he had a um, moderate uh, leukocytosis with a value of 29.68 uh, times 10 to the 9 per liter for leukocytes. Uh, and that was characterized by predominantly a neutrophilia um, and monocytosis, uh, with the eosinophils and lymphocytes being within the reference range. And that is typical of a partial stress leukogram. So we won't always have a full-on stress leukogram, uh, but it can also be a case of inflammation. Um, and the white blood cell count here is still within that level that we say could be just due to that stress leukogram. The machine is a pretty good one for the prosites, and they've alerted for the presence of nucleated red blood cells. And we know that the presence of nucleated red blood cells might interfere with that white blood cell count from the machine because some machines will count nuclear red blood cells as being uh, white blood cells. So we're going to need to look at the blood smear and double check if indeed we have nuclear red blood cells and how many we have and how much that will have impacted on that total white blood cell count. We then proceed to the red blood cell parameters and we can see that there is a really marked um, anemia with a hematocrit of 13. And someone has very helpfully written here a manual PCV uh, of 15 to 16. Now, obviously, there are differences between a manual PCV and a measured hematocrit from the machine. And we've mentioned that the measured hematocrit is calculated based on the um, number of red blood cells and the average volume of the red blood cells. And because it is based on those two um, parameters, it can uh, have erroneous um, results, especially if there's a problem with measuring either an accurate count for the red blood cells or an accurate volume. And one of the things that we see this most commonly is with agglutination. So if we have red blood cell agglutination, it's really important that we go and double check our hematocrit by doing a manual PCV. And we, if there is a significant discrepancy between the two, uh, we need to discard the hematocrit and the majority of the values that the machine has given us because they, for the red blood cell values, because they will be inaccurate. So a question that I often have is how much can there be a variation between the manual PCV and the hematocrit? And it's said that it's about 6% variation is expected between the two. And if the there is more of, the, of a difference from, from those 60%, 6%, 
then it's likely that we do have something that has interfered with the measurement of that hematocrit. Obviously, this is a severe anemia, and this is um, really well connected with the clinical signs that uh, Ronnie was demonstrating. So at this point uh, in an animal that is unstable, we need to consider, start considering the possibility of transfusion because of the severity and the fact that he's not compensated clinically. Um, we have the count from the machine for reticulocytes, and it says that it's got a high reticulocytosis. And again, we've mentioned that for uh, dogs, these um, in-house reticulocytes tend to be pretty good for the majority of the case. So again, I would like to go and look at the graphs and see if I have that nice comet shaped with a tail connecting to the head that tells us that this is consistent indeed with a regenerative anemia and with an accurate reticulocyte count. And um, we have a low mean corpuscular volume, uh, which says that this is a microcytic anemia. We have an increased RDW. Now, RDW is a value that I didn't speak much during our sessions. It's red distribution width, and it's just telling us the difference between the smallest uh, red blood cell and the biggest red blood cell, and it's telling us that it's high. So this is not a parameter that we see often or in all of the, our in-house analyses, but when we see it and it is increased, it reflects an esocytosis. So it's something that we can check on the blood smear. Then we have both the MCHC and the MCH decreased. So that tells us that this is a hypochromic anemia. And we have a low platelet count, which um, again, we're gonna need to um, check. Um, in our blood smear. So as a summary, we have a marked anemia, which is microcytic and hypochromic. We have increased red distribution width, which suggests an esocytosis. We have an automated reticular sound cut that is high that suggests uh, regenerative anemia um, and suspected nuclear red blood cells, which we're gonna check in the blood smear. But given that it's a regenerative anemia, it's likely that it's gonna be related with that. We have a mild to moderate thrombocytopenia. We're gonna check the blood smear to make sure that that's a, a real finding. And we have a leukocytosis that fits our stress leukogram. That's our summary for our in-house hematology. Now our in-house biochemistry was absolutely spot on normal. So again, not much to worry about. We will uh, focus on our hematologies for Ronnie. And this is, this is the blood smear exam. And again, if, if we do have anyone on the line and if you want to identify, if you can identify the cells, the two cells here that have arrows. Um, I don't know, Rebecca, if we do have anyone online yet? Yes, we do have a few online at the moment. Uh, just check in the chat box. Yep. Just type into your chat box or your question box, what do you think these cells with the arrow are? Okay, somebody has said NRBC. Yes, absolutely. So nuclear red blood cells is um, the um, uh, correct answer. And just to highlight here that we have uh, compare it to a lymphocyte, which is um, uh, on the right-hand side of the screen, and that the nuclear red blood cells, they tend to have a very much more condensed chromatin, um, and both of these are nuclear red blood cells, almost black chromatin, and they tend to have a more abundant cytoplasm that tends to be a similar color to our polychromatophils. Now, here in the red circle, we have a microcyte. So this is a... a, a a red blood cell that is smaller than the other red blood cells or the normal size red blood cells. And again, these tend to be the majority with a central third that is paler. So again, this is a very much this, a similar uh, cell with a still with a pale uh, center, but much, much smaller. So that's the microcyte. So it confirms what the machine was telling us that there were microcytoses. Again, it's really important to confirm that we have that central uh, paler area because if we don't on a perfectly small, perfectly round uh, red blood cell and 
uh, with no central pallor in a dog that um, makes it fairly suspicious for a spherocyte, which is not the case for, for this cell here in the red circle. And then here on the green circle, we have a young red blood cell. So it's bigger than your normal size red blood cell and it's more purple. So this is again confirming that we indeed have evidence of regeneration in this smear. And there are other cells here that are as well a little bit more purple. So they will be the polychromatophils. So they represent the reticulocytes in this smear. So Ronnie was referred to us because of his, the severity of his anemia. We should be progressing on this. Something is going on because the slides are not moving forward. And I don't know why. Let's just go. Oh, my computer's blocked. Can you still hear me? I can still hear you, Marta. <laughs> oh, Which is my good. problem with the slides. Yes. Um, so Ronnie was referred for um, because of the severity of his anemia. Oh, dear. Right, let's see. It progressed all of the slides ahead. Okay. Okay, let's see if this works. So um, he was um, referred because of the severity of the anemia. And this is um, the uh, hematology at our lab post referral. So the other ones were the values that they had in house at um, the zone vets. So it was referred to our um, hospital, referral hospital for transfusion and further diagnosis. So this is the hematology and it's pretty similar. We have a uh, still a very marked anemia, which has evidence of regeneration. Um, uh, the, but the MCV here is normal. Despite this, when we looked at the blood smear, we could still see a microcytic population, which was also hypochromic, and the hypochromasia was still seen on the values. And this is something that I would like to sh talk here because it's a, a common change that we see in bloods that are sent to our labs or to referral labs. And this is a change that happens in your mean corpuscular volume with transport and old samples. So with transport and old samples, we can see an increase in the mean corpuscular volume because of swelling of the cells during transit. And so in this case, we see cells that were microcytic trans being transformed into normocytic. And this can happen in cases as well of animals that have shunt and the microcytosis is, is changed to a normal volume. But most often what we see is that there is a cells that are within the range, within the reference interval for the mean corpuscular volume that are pushed and are outside the range. So they become macrocytic. But when you look at the smear, if it's a fresh uh, made blood smear, uh, they're still normocytic, normochromic. So just to highlight the importance of having that um, fresh, freshly made blood smear sent along with your blood to the lab so we can still perceive these changes to be um, artifact and related to transport. So this MCV here was, is within range, but the cells were actually microcytic, so they were still small. And we, indeed, we had the presence of nuclear red blood cells, so hence the corrected white blood cell counts. And that was still seen with neutrophilia, lymphopenia, and monocytosis. So again, part of our classical stress leukogram. So again, uh, just as a summary, we have a marked regenerative anemia with an hematocrit of uh, 15.9, and with microcytosis and hypochromasia, which reflect in this case iron deficiency, and also with polychromasia and anisocytosis, which reflect um, regeneration. Now, this regeneration was marked because we had a really high cell count of reticulocytes at 380. And in this case, the nuclear red blood cells, because we have this evidence of marked regeneration, are likely to be associated with this. But other differentials for the presence of nuclear red blood cells, especially when there is not 
evidence of regeneration or there isn't reticulocytosis are uh, bone marrow pathology, animals that have been splenectomized or that have splenic pathology, uh, chronic lead poisoning, um, erythroleukemia more often in cats and in those animals it's associated with an uh, FELV infection, so it's one of the things that we test for. Uh, and it can serve as a prognostic factor in heat shock cases. So, and the, again, the, the neutrophilia lymphopenia and monocytosis associated with stress leukogram, possibly inflammation, but we have no other evidence of that, such as toxic change or left shift. So in this case, we have microcytosis and hypochromasia, which is highly associated with, with iron deficiency, but we also have evidence of regeneration. Now, one of the most common causes, especially in more elderly animals of iron deficiency is actually chronic hemorrhage. So and when we have a regenerative anemia, we mainly think of um, hemolysis and hemorrhage as our main um, differentials. Uh, and so in this case, because of the iron deficiency in the regeneration, uh, hemorrhage would be uh, uh, one of the places to, to begin with, to look for where is this dog uh, bleeding or losing blood. Oh, come on. Okay. So biochemistry for Ronnie, um, it had a decreased creatinine. This is in the referral lab um, with uh, likely just due to reduced muscle mass because he hasn't been exercising. Um, we had a mild hypoproteinemia with total proteins of 57. And that was mainly characterized by hypoalbuminemia at 23.7. And this is a mild to moderate hypoalbuminemia. And again, we're thinking of hemorrhage, so potentially this is consistent with external blood loss, but it can also be with acute face pattern. And um, we'll go into the differentials for hypoalbuminemia next. Um, urinalysis, it was uh, mostly unreliable, apart from being uh, USG quite dilute in the isostenuric range um, of 1.013. And this is because the animal was straight away put on fluid. So if an animal comes in collapsed, fluid resuscitation is one of the first things you do. So this animal was straight away put on fluids. And that uh, is what is likely to have contributed to this USG being low. But obviously we can't rule out um, endocrinopathies uh, such as Cushing's. He was a fat dog. There's nothing else to support it but it is possibly present there. And obviously it isn't as a teammate, but we know that we lose the ability to concentrate the urine before we become as a teammate. So potentially renal disease is also possible. Because there are no other abnormalities and culture was negative, the thing to do with these cases is just recheck and see if this in, um, isostenuria, this lack of ability to concentrate the urine is persistent. So for the differentials for this low albumin that we have for Ronnie, uh, we can have low albumin either because we're not producing um, albumin, and that's to do mainly with hepatic failure or with starvation, cachexia or malabsorption that leads to not having enough building blocks to do proteins. Or most commonly, this decreased production is due to inflammation. Albumin is a negative acute phase protein. So it, we tend to see lots of cases with just a mild hypoalbuminemia associated just with the presence of inflammation. The other main way we can have uh, low albumin is because we're uh, losing albumin. Um, and that can be seen with hemorrhage. And that's usually seen along with low globulins as well and with anemia. So it could be potentially the case here. Or um, in cases of protein losing nephropathies, where we see um, a low albumin along with proteinuria and potentially with azotemia and high cholesterol. But in this case, we don't have uh, proteinuria, so this is not the case. We can see it in protein losing enteropathies, and that's seen along with low globulins and as well, usually low cholesterol. Um, but again, we have no GI signs in this case, so this is less likely, and the globulins were normal, it's just the albumin that was low. And we can see this with, again, um, parasitism and, and more rarely with burns or other extensive exudative um, dermopathologies. So these acute phase proteins that I've talked, which is albumin is a negative one, is they're a group of plasma 
or serum proteins whose concentrations changed um, in response to anti-inflammatory stimulus. Um, they, they are called major, moderate, or minor, depending on how much they change, uh, with the major changing in, in thousands and the minor changing lightly. Uh, and they're also called positive, which means they increase with inflammation, or negative means they decrease with inflammation. And the typical um, examples for these negative accused phase proteins are albumin and transferrin. And albumin... Um, it's basically because the liver is kind of producing other proteins um, and therefore kind of diverts the resources to build albumin to build the other proteins and so produces a little bit less albumin and transferrin because it's a way of keeping iron uh, less available to uh, microorganisms that also need it for their metabolic processes. Um, now, the positive acute trace proteins are species dependent. In the dog, we have mainly the CRP, C-reactive protein, and haptoglobin. And in the cat, we look mainly at um, AGP, or alpha-1 acid glycoprotein, and the serum amyloid A. And both uh, acute phase proteins are unspecific, but the very sensitive markers are of inflammation. So any major inflam inflammation, and they will go up. Um, but they will um, don't tell you what type of inflammation you have. Now, in the dog, the CRP is commonly measured for this, for monitoring inflammation, and uh, specifically is uh, used a lot nowadays as a marker for inflammation while under therapeutic um, trials with steroids and other anti-inflammatories, but specifically with steroids because steroids lead to increases in haptoglobin, but they do not lead to increase, increases in CRP. So for example, if I have a dog which has a, an immune-mediated polyarthritis, one of the ways that we can measure how this dog is responding to our steroid treatment is by measuring, uh, by serial measurements of the C-reactive protein. So acute phase protein is very, very useful for detecting inflammation and to monitor some of these animals. So Ronnie, um, because Often uh, older animals, we know we have iron deficiency with him, and in older animals, this is often associated with GI tract disease, leading to low-grade chronic GI hemorrhage. Um, went, uh, underwent imaging studies uh, with CT and um, ultrasound, and there was no cause for this hemorrhage ID. Uh, we could also do uh, fecal occult blood analysis, but it's not the greatest of tests. You have to have an exclusion diet um, that's put in uh, for a, a, a while because just having protein in your diet can, can to that test become positive. So actually imaging is probably the best way to go. And for Ronnie, he responded really well to transfusion and flea um, treatment. And so we um, arrived to the diagnosis that he was just suffering from an extreme flea burden. And in the absence of identifying any other cause of anemia, and because he'd resolved following the treatment, this is most likely the, the, the result or the cause for, for his anemia. Just the, that really marked um, flea burden. Um, so iron deficiency anemia is most commonly associated with chronic blood loss, and less commonly it can be nutritional, uh, especially in young, young animals. Um, the chronic blood loss most commonly comes from the GI or from the urinary tract, and because it is low grade, it can be uh, missed by the owner. So it is useful to you know, probe the owners for that melina. We know that they don't always perceive it as such. And it is useful to test the urine to see if we have low degrees of blood. It won't be frank hematuria. It will be more likely that the owner will not have picked it up. For the GI tract, for younger animals, they tend to be more on the, because of heavy parasitic, parasitic burden. For older animals, it tends to be more likely that it's due to GI ulcers or GI neoplasia leading to low-grade bleeding. But again, this case was secondary to that. Um, high flea burden. And for those of you who think, but this is, was a really severe anemia, the lowest PCV that I've seen in an animal with iron deficient anemia, it was a young animal, but that was a PCV of seven. So it, it, they can go to pretty extremes because it's very chronic, it's low grade. So they basically adjust and ad adapt to that degree of anemia. So um, 
with, with the iron deficiency anemia, it's good to remember those new parameters of reticulocytes that I've mentioned in the talks. And remember, these new parameters are available with some analyzers. And they allow for measurement of the average volume of reticulocytes and the average hemoglobin concentration of reticulocytes. Now, reticulocytes in the dog circulate for only approximately two days versus 100 days for the average um, dog erythrocyte, which means that that volume of those reticulocytes and particularly the hemoglobin content of the reticulocytes represents the iron that you have available for hemoglobin synthesis within the past two to four days rather than longer periods in time. So we can use these parameters for the mean volume of the reticulocytes and the mean uh, concentration of hemoglobin in the reticulocytes as early indicators of iron-restricted hematopoiesis. And this is um, really important in these iron deficient animals because we know that we have to supplement them for much longer than it takes to get those values in the red blood cells up to normal. So as long as we still have those values um, abnormal, we should carry on on that supplementation. So anemia due to chronic hemorrhage usually starts off by being just a normal regenerative anemia and showing the macrocytosis and hypochromasia that we see with regenerative anemias. As the marrow keeps regenerating, there is loss of iron or they, they end up using the storage of iron. So it, this becomes the limiting factor for the production of new red blood cells. Now, one of the ways that the marrow knows that that red blood cell is mature is when they reach a certain amount of hemoglobin. Because there's less iron, they take longer to reach that amount of hemoglobin, so they carry on dividing. So you see microcytosis, they become smaller. And we often see that microcytosis before we see the hypochromasia. So it's one of the things that I look for in these animals. And then as it progresses and as the iron storages become more and more depleted, there is less production of these red blood cells. And there is a point in time where there is no longer reticulocytosis and that anemia becomes um, non-regenerative, microcytic, hypochromic. Now, it's really important to think that anemia of chronic or inflammatory disease, which is the most common type of non-regenerative anemia that you guys see in practice, um, this is usually seen as uh, moderate to mild, normocytic, normochromic, non-regenerative anemia. But occasionally, because of this iron-restricted erythropoiesis, we can see this leading to microcytic anemias. And the, uh, this iron-restricted erythropoiesis happens because of that acute phase pattern that I mentioned. So we, the body makes iron less available to the organisms that are potentially infecting our um, dog. But they also mean that that iron becomes less available for the erythropoiesis. So you can get microcytic anemias that are due to um, iron-restricted erythropoiesis and are not because of iron deficiency. They're because of this restricted availability of the iron. So it is possible that you need to assess iron metabolism, and there's several ways you can do that. But the ones that is most commonly done is by measuring serum iron along with total iron binding capacity. And total iron binding capacity gives us the amount of iron that I can transport. So it gives us an indirect way of measuring our transferritin saturation. Ferritin would be the most useful um, marker to do in these situations because it will be what allows us to differ truly differentiate between an iron deficient anemia and anemia of chronic disease. But this is really difficult assay to, to get. So just as a reminder, when we have anemia, one of the first things we ask for is, is it regenerative or non-regenerative? And then we go down the path of hemorrhage and, or hemolysis and for the non-regenerative of bone marrow disease or systemic disease. And it's really useful to look at the patterns that we have from the machine in terms of the volume and in terms of the amount of hemoglobin. And we know that macrocytic hypochromic anemias tend to be regenerative of anemias, so again down the hemorrhage or hemolysis, that normocytic normochromic anemias tend to be non-regenerative anemias or pre-regenerative anemias, and that those microcytic uh, hypochromic anemias most often are due to this iron deficiency. It can be seen also with portosystemic shunts and liver disease because 
of the liver being the organ that makes these proteins that, may, that handle our iron metabolism. If we have a macrocytic anemia without evidence of regeneration and that it's normochromic, then again, we're looking at myeloproliferative disease. In cats, it's strongly related with FELV infections. So, you know, these common patterns that we can get from the red blood cell values help us immensely in finding out what type of anemia we have. So that's our first case, um, Ronnie. And um, I ask if we have any, any questions for Ronnie. I don't see any questions at the moment. Let's see if the slides progress to the next case. There's the circle of doom. <laughs> appearing. There we go. Well, I'll start and while this tries to, oh, there we go. So let's do Kaylee's two. So um, our case two is Flick. Flick is a, a 10 year old um, female uh, entire domestic long hair. And she's got quite a chronic history. So it's several months of intermittent appetite and subdued demeanor. And, you know, it's very, very typical for some of our patients. They present with no specific clinical signs. There's nothing, no vomiting, no diarrhea. Her weight remains stable. But the owner is voicing those concerns that the cat is just not well. So this, we, we often see this in practice. And, and basically what we do is we do a good physical examination and we, go, we do blood work and we let that guide us in, in, in our case. So with Flick, she was, um, in, uh, she was bright, alert and responsive. She was slim, even though that there was no reported uh, weight loss. So she had a body condition score of four out of nine. Her heart rate was 130 bits per minute. So not really that tachycardic, so normal thermic. She was fairly comfortable on abdominal palpation with a subjectively normal liver size and normal kidney size. Her mucous membranes were normal. There was no evidence of jaundice or pallor and, you know, pretty much unremarkable uh, physical examination. She wasn't too keen on uh, blood pressure and also did not allow um, for fundic uh, exam to see if there's evidence of chronic hypertension. So you then proceed to do bloods and um, we have here the hematology and also the coagulation for uh, a PT and APTT for Flick. Uh, and just to remind the PT, we're measuring our extrinsic and common pathways. And with APTT, we're measuring our intrinsic and common pathways. And together, they uh, kind of help us understand the um, secondary hemostasis. Um, now, again, just to remind, these are citrated uh, plasma uh, measurements. There are a couple of uh, machines in-house that measure PT and APTT. Um, you have to be really careful with cats uh, if the blood is fairly dehydrated or in dogs if there is agglutination you can get false results with these in-house machines. Now she was not anemic um, with uh, hemoglobin, hematocrit and number of red blood cells well within the reference interval but she was microcytic from the machine and that was confirmed on the smear exams. So again, on our microcytosis, we're, we're seeing like a pattern appearing today. She was uh, markedly thrombocytopenic, but again, we know that the platelets in cats are often uh, erroneous measured by the machines. So we went to check the blood smear and there were lots of clumps on um, the feathered edge of the smear. And therefore that platelet count was um, erroneously low and there were plenty of platelets in, in the smear. We then had a fairly unremarkable white blood cell. So in this case, the hematology is fairly uh, normal. Okay, there is no anemia, but there is microcytosis. That's the only abnormality. Now, causes of microcytosis, we've already touched on those, so blood loss anemia or iron deficiency, but there is no anemia. Uh, we mentioned liver disease and portosystemic shunts is giving us microcytic normal chromic um, red blood cells, and that's due to that iron metabolism being abnormal. 
And this can be seen with and without anemia, so potentially the case here. Again, we've mentioned that anemia of chronic disease, but again, she's not anemic, so less likely you don't become microcytic before you become anemic for anemia of chronic disease, so it's less likely. Uh, Akitas and other oriental dog breeds, but not for cats, so that's excluded. Um, hyperthyroid cats can have microcytosis, and um, again, that's to do with, with how the iron metabolism is, is going. And uh, um, hyponatremia or excess EDTA um, can also lead to uh, microcytosis. Now, excess EDTA or not having enough blood to fill your tube is quite common in cats, um, but this was confirmed on the blood smear exam, so that's not the case, okay? Because um, if it was from excess EDTA, we would have not seen the microcytosis on the smear. So again, we're gonna need to look at the biochemistry. And the biochemistry, again, we have a low urea, and low urea is usually due to either a liver disease or to do with um, a, a lack of protein or a malabsorption of protein in the diet because urea comes from protein metabolism. We have a low creatinine, which again reflects just with um, the most, um, the lack of muscle mass or the fact that it was on a fair, fairly uh, slim body condition. Um, we have a mild hypoglobulinemia, but it's just above the reference interval, so we're not too worried about it. And then we have an ALT that is indeed significant because we're seeing it more than four or five times the reference uh, interval and a mild change in the ALP. However, in cats, we have to remember that the ALP in cats have a half-life of only six hours. So even milder decreases in these liver enzymes can be significant in cats. We have a very borderline bilirubin um, increase Again, not massively concerned at this point, but again, pointing us towards our liver. Uh, a borderline high calcium, which I'm not too worried. Fasting bile acids that were normal, but then a really stonking ammonia. That ammonia is really, really high. And so we need to further investigate this liver. Now for urinalysis for Flick, we had pretty much unremarkable findings with normal pH, um, uh, a normal uh, UPC, and the USG was 1025. Because uh, Flick was not azotemic, this is very much normal, and no significant cells or crystals were identified. So just to remind the parameters that we usually test in liver disease, we have the hepatocellular damage or leakage enzymes, such as ALT and AST, and we have our cholestatic uh, parameters such as ALP and GGT. And then we'll also look very much for function markers. And so substances that are either produced by the liver or conjugated and excreted by the liver. So for substances produced by the liver, cholesterol, urea, glucose, albumin, and coagulation factors. And for substances that are conjugated and excreted by the liver, we have uh, bile acids and bilirubin. Remember that we need to evaluate those liver enzymes in terms of magnitude of increase. And remember that AST is not really hepatospecific. It can come from muscle as well. And remember that ALP can be um, induced by things like phenobarb and um, in dogs by steroids, not so much in cats. So ALT is our most sensitive and specific, and specific marker for hepatocellular damage, certainly much more sensitive and specific than AST. It has a very short half-life and the reference range is um, lower than um, in most dogs. So relatively small increases tend to be more significant in cats than they are in dogs. Remember that ALT can rise in primary liver disease, but it all can also occur secondary to drugs or secondary liver disease. It can be even a, a, a consequence of cholestasis because um, the bile can be to toxic onto the hepatocytes. And in very, very rare cases of really severe muscle damage after uh, road traffic accidents or crush injuries, we can have some ALT that is released from the muscle, but that's not often the case. So just to remind patterns of changes in liver enzymes in acute hepatic injury, um, we get release of ALT first, which is followed shortly by AST. Again, um, the AST uh, has a, a, a 
shorter half-life so the ALT will linger longer not just because it's got a longer half-life but also because there's continued synthesis and release during hepatocellular repair so it doesn't drop as quickly and then if we have intra hepatic swelling of the hepatocytes that can lead to intrahepatic cholestasis so you can have um, uh, increase in um, uh, alkaline phosphatase for patterns that we see with cholestasis there especially if it's extra hepatic cholestasis such a bile duct obstruction we see the opposite we see that the our cholestatic markers tend to increase first, and particularly in extra hepatic cholestasis, GGT tends to increase first. ALP follows, but it can um, become higher increases than GGT. And ALT and AST will also increase, especially if there is that toxic um, damage of the bile toxicity onto the hepatocytes. So as a summary for Flick main findings so far, we had microcytosis only on the hematology. We had decreased creatinine representing low muscle mass. We had low urea that could be either to low protein intake or malabsorption or secondary to liver disease. We had the low albumin on the low normal and the increased uh, globulins, which again fits that acute phase response that we've talked about. We had the four times increase in ALP and less than two times increase in ALP a normal GGT, mild increase in bilirubin, and uh, normal fasting bile acids and increased ammonia. So we looked at further tests to do a full investigation. For example, one of the things that we said that could lead to um, microcytosis and can lead to changes in um, liver enzymes is hyperthyroidism. So we did further tests to uh, um, rule out that, and we looked at the liver a little bit more. So for Flick, we did a total T4, which is well within the reference interval. So if we have a, a hyperthyroid cat that has superimposed disease, I expect to see that um, total T4 to sit at the top end if we have a euthyroid sick syndrome superimposed on a hyperthyroid cat. If it brings it, the T4 back to normal values, it's usually at the top end of the reference interval. So the fact that this was at the bottom end of the reference interval means that it's far less likely that this cat has hypothyroidism. It, the FPLI was normal, so as well that we have no evidence of pancreatitis that could lead to secondary um, uh, liver damage and, and release of the hepatocellular markers. We had no evidence of um, GI disease or malabsorption that could lead them to this low urea, for example, or that could be part of a, something like a triaditis. Um, so B12 and folate saying that we have normal absorption. And we had a full bile acid stimulation test that had the preprandial or fasting bile acids at 12.4, which is within normal, but a postprandial markedly increased at 87. So when we see this disproportionate increase, we consider shunt um, uh, as a possibility for exponential increases. And obviously, some people might ask, why do we have uh, a fasting bile acid that is normal and a high ammonia? And one of the reasons that we do the bile acid stin test, it's because we know it's more sensitive to pick up liver dysfunction than it is just the fasting bile acids. So that bile acid stimulation test is more sensitive at picking up liver dysfunction. So while the fasting bile acids did not pick up, the postprandial bile acids put, picked up that liver dysfunction. Now you can have um, increased ammonia with normal bile acid stimulation tests, both pre and postprandial, uh, but this is a, a rare occasion. It's a urea cycle defects and that can lead to increased ammonias. Plus measuring ammonia in house is quite tricky. And uh, as far as I'm aware, there is no good way of doing that in house. Um, there's none of the machines are particularly reliable to measure ammonia in-house. So in most cases, in practice, we still um, have to measure the bile acids. So for Flick, the increased liver enzymes reflect a primary hepatopathy in this case, because we've excluded the most common secondary hepatopathies. There is evidence of liver dysfunction. We have low urea, which likely 
reflects reduced hepatic synthesis, we have increased ammonia, and we have that increase in postprandial bile acids in the presence uh, of a normal T bilirubin. So, you know, this is also supportive of liver dysfunction. Other parameters that we can see affected by poor liver function include low albumin, which this one was just at the low of end of the reference range, cholesterol, uh, and low glucose, uh, high bilirubin, and increased clotting times. We've done the clotting times for Flick, and she was normal. So then we proceeded investigating this liver by doing a liver FNA. Now, cytology and liver aspirates are not really good at giving us a definitive diagnosis, but they can good, be a good screening method, and they can guide us. Okay, and in this case, we had a marked vacuolar epitopathy, as might be expected from hepatic lipidosis, and potentially a mild inflammatory response. Now, the, this mild inflammatory response, again, it's something that the uh, cytology is not really good at detecting. So you're going to need, a, in a lot of cases, you're going to need the biopsy and the histopathology to get a definitive diagnosis. Now, we all remember that uh, hepatic lipidosis is not a diagnosis, so we need to find the underlying cause because hepatic lipidosis is just a consequence to other diseases, processes that lead to anorexia and lead to increased lipid mobilization from the peripheral fat storages. And that mobilization then accumulates within the liver, leading to hepatic um, uh, lipidosis. In this case, we did abdominal imaging and we screened, we did a lot of screening tests that did not document any obvious underlying trigger for this vacuolar epitopathy and for this lipidosis, such as pancreatitis. So we had to do histopathology. So we went in and we did um, uh, exploratory laparotomy that, and a liver biopsy. And the liver biopsy came back as mixed chronic lymphocytic, plasmacytic, and neutrophilic cholangitis with portal fibrosis. Um, so this is suggestive of a chronic low-grade response to an ascending bacterial infection within the biliary tree. And obviously, it was also seen a vacuolar hepatopathy, uh, so hepatic lipidosis, which is likely secondary to that inflammation. While we're doing the exploratory laparotomy, we could see that uh, Flick had acquired portosystemic shunt, um, and this is likely secondary to that fibrosis that we're seeing. Now, there's a, a, a lot of markers for hepatic pathology that can provide information with variable sensitivity and specificity. But in a lot of cases, imaging and ultimately liver biopsy are often required for a definitive diagnosis. And I'm sure you will have more on this on modules to follow. However, laboratory tests can aid in the prognosis for liver disease. And we can see that if we have persistent or worse elevations in ALT and AST, that is indicative of continuing damage. So that shows us that this is still the case. There's still liver disease. However, the level of the increase does not necessarily reflect the level or the degree of uh, severity of the disease in liver. And here we could see that the ALT was only increased uh, four times, but the liver disease was severe enough to lead to having an acquired shunt because of that portal fibrosis. So when we have um, these increases in liver enzymes, they, such as ALT and AST, how can we monitor if this is going the right way or the wrong way, progressing these cases when we start treatment? Well, ideally, we should have these liver enzymes, particularly ALT, following by approximately 50% every three to four days in the, cat, in the dog and slightly more quickly in the cat. With end-stage liver disease, we often tend to see not these markedly elevated liver enzymes, so not 10 times above the reference interval, but we see concurrent changes in liver function markers. So we can see particularly for worse prognosis, things like hypoglycemia or worsening hypoalbuminemia in the absence of other causes. In really more severe cases, we can also have increases in PT, an APTT that can lead um, to uh, uh, coagulation disorders. So this is just a, an example of a case where we will have to do further tests with, where just screening tests are clin, uh, with ClinPath and we need the histo to get the definitive diagnosis.
Do you have any questions on Flick? Any gonna, questions for now? I'm going to carry on then with uh, case three. Yeah. Um, do you have a question? No, sorry, I meant carry on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, so Cooper, I'm going to try and do it a little bit quicker because I know we're um, getting short on time. Um, so Cooper is a one-year-old, um, nine months, male entire, uh, Chao Chao, who was found recumbent and unresponsive in the garden a few hours after returning from a long walk. And he was uh, unresponsive and recumbent with a very high temperature. And he was uh, hypotensive with systolic blood pressure at 90, despite having a normal heart rate. And um, he had petechia on the skin and the remainder of physical examination was fairly unremarkable. Now, remember we talked about when should we look at the blood smear and one of the things that was recommended was when we have critically ill patients. And this is certainly one of those cases. I then gave you a bunch of other uh, criteria for um, when we should look at um, hematology. And again, we're having a problem with the slides, not moving forward. Oh, there we go. Um, but um, you'll have those in your notes, all of those uh, criteria. In this case, because he's critically ill, even if the hematology counts were all within normal, we should still be looking at the blood smear to try and find out what is wrong with this animal. So going through the hematology, there's evidence of uh, hemoconcentration with really uh, markedly increased uh, hematocrit. Now, if uh, Cooper was a greyhound, I wouldn't be worried, but uh, given that he's a chow, uh, we really shouldn't have that increased hematocrit. So we have increased hemoglobin, increased hematocrit, and increased number of red blood cells. So this is either hemoconcentration or polycythemia. Uh, given um, his case, um, as presenting collapse, one of the first things we do for investigating cases like this is put these animals on fluid, fluid resuscitation and see if this is persistent. If, if we can't, um, if it's not just due to hemoconcentration, uh, it won't be resolved just because you've put the animal on fluids. We then had a low platelet count and um, a low platelet count uh, uh, in this case, we had petechia, so that's clinical signs that we tend to associate with uh, primary hemostasis and certainly low platelet counts that comes there. But different levels of platelet counts are related to different causes. And at this level, the most common cause is consumption. So used, the platelets are being used because there's trying to stop a hemorrhage or blood loss, trying to form a clot. And again, this is the most common cause for mild to moderate thrombocytopenias when we discard our false or artifactual uh, thrombocytopenias, which we have done by confirming the thrombocytopenia on smear. So we have a really thrombocytopenia. Again, causes for thrombocytopenia, mainly four, consumption, as we've mentioned, uh, destruction, such as destruction in immune-mediated thrombocytopenia, um, not being produced by the bone marrow, and that could be related to bone marrow disease or secondary um, systemic disease leading to bone marrow issues, um, or they can be sequestered within the spleen. Now we tend to see petechia when we see really low numbers of platelets. So we tend to see petechia when we have platelets less than 50. And so at 100, we don't usually tend to see petechia. So I think we need to think of other primary hemostasis defects in order to possibly account for the degree of petechia that we're seeing. So primary hemostasis defects, we tend to think of low platelet numbers, which we have here, but maybe not to the degree that we would expect. We tend to think of platelet dysfunction or thrombocytopathies, and that could be, for example, secondary to some drugs. We know that paracetamol can, can lead to um, platelet dysfunction. There are other drugs, drugs that can influence platelet function. Von Willebrand disease, which is actually a uh, quite common disease, and that can lead to petechia, and the platelets are fine in number and function. And then problems with the, blo the blood vessel wall, so vasculitis, that can lead to, to thermocytopenia as well. So we have to keep those in mind because I'm not sure that the platelet numbers here can account for the clinical signs that we're seeing. 
Then we have again a corrected white blood cell count that um, has been corrected because of the presence of nuclear red blood cells. And we have on the film comments that we have polychromasia and mesocytosis, which are signs for regeneration when we really have uh, an animal that shouldn't be regenerating because it has too many red blood cells. So that again is something that doesn't match. Um, and again, we have that leukogram pattern of neutrophilia, lymphopenia, monocytosis, which fits with the stress. However, we have a left shift by the presence of banned neutrophils, and that's a regenerative left shift, but the presence of a left shift suggests potentially we do have inflammation or infection. So we then, with the biochemistry, This is so disconcerting because then it moves three slides forward. Um, so Cooper Biochemistry, he's acetemic. Um, he has uh, increased total protein uh, with increased albumin and, and globulins. And this is great because there's only one uh, um, diagnosis, differential diagnosis for increased albumin, which is dehydration. Okay, so because we have that increased albumin, we know that at least in part, some of that azotemia, which is the increased urea and creatinine, at least in part, it will be pre-renal. It will be due to the hydration. I still want to check my urine analysis to check if there is evidence of renal dysfunction, but at least some of it might be due to the hydration. Then we have significant increases in ALT, above 10 times above the reference range. Uh, mild increases in ALP, two times above the reference range, marked increases in AST, and that's much more marked increase than ALT, which tells me that some of this AST will likely come from that CK, will come from the muscle damage. So we have a C creatinine kinase of 56,000, so it's a huge number which shows mus muscle damage. So some of that AST will come from uh, the muscle. Then we have a mild increase in GGT, which is less than two times above the reference interval. And again, we have an increase in sodium and chloride, which fit with that dehydration. Now we needed to look at that urinalysis. And the urinalysis has an increased pH. And that alkaline pH, when it's above eight, can lead to false positives in the urine strip. So it's really important that in these cases, we check proteinuria by looking at DUPC, by looking at protein to creatinine ratio. And here we have a protein to creatinine ratio that is markedly increased at 16. Look at the reference range is less than 0.5. And we also have evidence of this uh, proteinuria by the presence of uh, coarse granular casts and hyaline casts. So we have definitely the kidney losing some of this protein. Now, again, that specific, specific gravity of 1010 is uh, really, really dilute. So I want to know if this animal has been put straight away on fluid, which is likely the case, and then I won't be able to interpret this specific gravity with the same certainty. Now, I'd like to point out that we have here that the blood is positive, three pluses, but we see no red blood cells in our sediment. And that tells me that that blood that is positive on the urine strip is either due to myoglobinuria, which could be the case here because of the markedly increase of CKs, or to hemoglobinuria, which is less likely the case here because instead of a decreased hematocrit, which you would see with intravascular hemolysis, we have an increased hematocrit. So that blood there doesn't actually represent blood, it represents that myoglobin. Now, that markedly increased protein to creatinine ratio could be influenced by the presence on cells um, on um, the urine, and particularly the presence of red blood cells. It's been demonstrated that if you add blood to the urine, as soon as we start seeing that pink uh, coming through macroscopically from the added blood, that is enough to affect our UPC. So basically, if the urine is started to look pink, don't trust the UPC, get more measurements. And it, we do interpret the UPC in a non-active animal 
in a non-azotemic animal differently than we do in an azotemic animal. In a non-azotemic animal, if we have less than 0.5, that is considered normal. If it's between 0.5 and 1 for that ratio, the proteinuria should be rechecked. And the recommendations is we check three or more samples in two to three weeks to demonstrate persistence. And again, the reason why we're doing this is because we know that changes in the urine precede changes in azotemia and chronic renal failure. So it's one of those things. If we have proteinuria, first thing we do is we check for persistence. <coughs> if the animal is not, not azotemic, because it can precede azotemia in renal failure. And if we have a, a UPC greater than two, again, if there is no active sediment, no evidence of hemorrhage, no evidence of inflammation, that is suggestive of glomerular disease or gross proteinuria. Now, if an animal is azotemic, that is different. And according to the iris staging system, we want, if an animal is azotemic, for the UPC value to be even lower, so to be less than 0.2. So that's what we define as non-proteinuric. So this animal was azotemic and with a very marked increased um, UPC. Now, one of the reasons why uh, the international panels recommend that you repeat the UPC to set, check for persistence is because we know that there is fluctuations uh, in this UPC in the normal animals, okay? And one of the things that makes this fluctuation is stress. So we can have transient proteinuria just secondary to stress. And we know this because someone's compared the UPC on animals collected at home to animals collect, to urine of animals collected in the hospital settings for the same animals. And it was demonstrated that approximately 50% of them have higher UPC in hospital samples when compared to samples collected at home. So if we have these animals that we're just monitoring and checking and the UPC comes high, when we're doing that recheck, we do it with the urine that was collected from home so that we, we account for this. The other thing that was demonstrated is that the, if the UPC is high, in order for the values to be significantly changed, we need to have a really significant differences between these repeated samples to make it a, a significant change. We're talking at 35% at high UPC values and 80% at low UPC values, which means that I almost need to double that 0 0.5 before it becomes, oh, it's increasing significantly, okay? Um, and they said, this study said that actually if the UPC is less than four, one measurement should be okay. If higher UPCs, then we might need to, again, to repeat these measurements a lot. So just as a summary, for the significance of the proteinuria, it varies with the patient. So it's not a one test will give you the answer for sure. It needs to be demonstrated that it's a persistent finding. We evaluate it differently if I have evidence of renal disease or not. And I need always to look at my urine and my urine sediments to make sure that that proteinuria is indeed from the kidney. And we think of proteinuring as being pre-renal, renal, and post-renal. And in pre-renal, we can see it with things like hyperproteinemia, such as in multiple myeloma, leading to the presence of benz jones proteins in the urine. And the other causes, hypothermia, intense exercises, stress, seizures, the venous congestion, they tend to give a mild and a transient, so not persistent, uh, proteinuria. Renal could be glomerular or tubular, and post-renal is when we have evidence of inflammation or hematuria from post-renal pelvis or from extra urinary sources such as the GI tract. So just a quick picture of how those casts that were described would look like. So this is on our um, SETI stain, so just our urine sediment with a drop of SETI stain. And this bit here is what it looks like when it's just protein. And this bit here with the content is um, a granular, it's what we call a granular, so it's just degraded cells or protein leading to granular casts. And just very quickly, I don't know if you can see the arrow, but I'm circling at the moment, that's the size of a red blood cell on the sediment. So we look for the casts with a low objective, okay, with the objective time times objective, not with a high objective, because that's my red blood cell, it's tiny, okay? If we go straight for the times 40, we will miss out some of these casts.
And this is just cytology. So I just take one drop of the sediment before I add the SETI stain, put it on a slide, air dry it and stain it with my diff quick. And I can visualize again, the, these casts, which are just made of protein. There's no cells in it, that's just protein. So with Cooper, we repeated the urinalysis to see if it was persistent, the UPC, and note that the pH is still high and we still have that blood, which is unlikely to be blood. And that, look, the UPC has decreased, but it's still there. Okay, so we still have persistent protein urea. So as a summary, Cooper had increased red blood cells, which are just either hemoconcentration or polycythemia. And given the clinical findings, the increased total proteins and albumins and the increased sodium, this makes uh, all of it saying that hypertonic dehydration is the most likely cause here. So it's pure water loss. There was a thrombocytopenia that needs further evaluation. So we need to consider the IC, consumption. So we're gonna look for hemorrhages. There is a mature neutrophilia and lymphopenia monocytosis, which is consistent with a stress leukogram, but there's a little bit of inflammation. So maybe, uh, um, maybe there is inflammation or infection. So one of the things that we know is that this Cooper was a, um, a heat stroke and presented as such. And I mentioned it before, but the presence of the nucleated red blood cells in heat stroke is a poor prognostic indicator and reflects damage uh, to the bone marrow matrix by the high temperature. So the temperature of this animal was so high that basically it cooked even its bone marrow. And that led to the release of younger red blood cells that didn't need to be released and led to the release of the banned neutrophils that didn't need to be released and led to the release of these nucleated red blood cells. So the, the, these nuclear red blood cells the, uh, and this evidence of regeneration in the absence of anemia were quite significant. We know that there was a isostenuria in the presence of azotemia and hemoconcentration. So again, renal impairment, either acute or, or um, in this case, it was acute. And that there was proteinuria and the presence of granular and hyaline casts. So again, supportive of renal proteinuria. And this was persistent even after resolution of the dehydration, azotemia, and he hemoconcentration. So this is one of the cases where I would think that monitoring SDMA and urinalysis would be really useful for the future on this animal because he can develop a chronic kidney disease post its acute kidney injury, secondary to that heat stroke. And one of the, the ways we can monitor this animal better instead of just being for monitoring for the acetemia is by using SDMA and by measuring urinalysis. However, there would have been no point in measuring that SDMA in our original sample because I know that if I have a uh, decreased gamma filtration rate from the dehydration that my SDMA will be high so that it wouldn't serve as a basal value for this animal. It would be useful if we had an, a a value of the SDMA for him, for Cooper, before this incident that we could have used as a monitoring tool. And again, it's blocked. Sit. So the clinical signs for Cooper were consistent with heat stroke, uh, which included coagulopathy. And the petechiation here um, could potentially be secondary to uh, the uh, heat stroke because we know we see vascular damage with heat stroke. So that could lead to that uh, vasculitis that could lead to the, to the petechiation. And the platelets could be just from consumption or he could be going into the IC. So we, it would be potentially appropriate to measure um, uh, a D-dimer as, as uh, evidence of increased fibrinolysis. We had acute kidney injury and hypoglycemia, which wasn't shown here, and the presence of nuclear red blood cells. Now, the severity and increase of CK in this case is unusual. It was assumed to be secondary to rhabdomyolysis as a result of direct thermal muscular damage and increased um, muscular activity and recumbency. But again, with um, this increased CK and the myoglobinuria, we know that uh, myoglobinuria can lead to 
um, glomerular damage, so it can well contribute to the uh, renal disease. Given the fact that Cooper was persistently proteinuric, and given the fact that its urine was persistently dilute, even when the azotemia had resolved, the possibility of progression from acute kidney injury to chronic renal failure is possible here. So again, those serial measurements of SDMA would be really useful here. Any questions on case three? Rebecca, no? No question. Can't see anybody. No. Okay, so that, that takes us to the, to the end of the seminar. I've um, exceeded the time a little bit, but I think that's, that should be okay. Oh, uh, sorry, we do have one question. Okay. Mark. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's just a question, did he survive? Yes, yes he did. Uh, so even with the poor prognostic markers, he, he was um, fairly, he was in our RCU for a long time. He had plasma transfusions because of the suspicions that he might go into the IC um, and a lot of supportive treatment, obviously trying to cool him down and then sustain him. But yes, he survived. So that, that second year analysis was when he was discharged and again, this hints our concerns for the long term for uh, Cooper potentially developing um, chronic kidney injury.